One significant issue raised by recent foreign interventions against terrorism concerns the application of the law of non-international armed conflict to the territory of a state which assists another state located far away from it in fighting against armed groups. This is, for example, the case of the Western states helping Iraq to fight against ISIL. It is well known that some of those states, including Belgium and France, have been the object of attacks claimed to be carried out on behalf of ISIL on their territory. This leads to the question of whether IHL applies to measures taken by Belgium and France within their own territory. A number of scholars have argued that as those states are party to the armed conflicts against the terrorist groups, it logically follows that IHL should apply to them. Of course, it should not apply to all the incidents occurring in the territory of those states. But according to the jurisprudence of the international criminal tribunals, only to the incidents which, in that territory, are linked to the armed conflict against ISIL. This would include acts carried out by the states against members of that terrorist group, such as targeting and detention, but also acts carried out by members of that group against the states. However, this view is controversial. Its critics argue that no active hostilities are occurring in the territory of those intervening states, which are very far away from the real battlefield in Iraq. They also emphasize the danger of such an expansive interpretation of the scope of application of IHL. This raises the familiar objection to overly expansive interpretations of the scope of application of IHL, namely that it would allow states to rely on IHL in order to depart from the more restrictive human rights obligations, especially with respect to the use of lethal force. However, we have already emphasized that the applicability of IHL, in particular to regions under the firm control of a state, does not necessarily mean that such a state would be entitled to use lethal force against legitimate target, instead of attempting first to arrest and capture the person. We will not come back to the alternative views that we have already studied in detail in the first chapter of this course. In addition, states should not fear that applying IHL to members of terrorist groups would give some rights to those groups, such as the right to target the military forces of the states. Unlike in international armed conflict, where IHL creates privileged combatants, IHL does not give any right to members of armed groups to take up arms against a state. Armed groups do not have a right to take part in a non-international armed conflict, but the, ev the event that they do, IHL imposes a series of limits on their conduct. In other words, even if IHL applies to them, they could still be prosecuted for their participation in hostilities under domestic law. Why IHL in itself does not create any bar to prosecution in such cases, other branches of international law may cause challenges in this respect. For instance, certain international treaties against terrorism and some of the domestic legislation that implements those treaties provide that members of armed forces party to an armed conflict in the sense of IHL cannot be prosecuted for terrorist offenses if the acts for which they are prosecuted are regulated by IHL. This is often called the exclusion clause, excluding from the terrorist offenses acts of armed forces regulated by IHL. The question of whether armed forces include not only military forces but also armed groups is still debated. Although in some states, such as in Belgium, case law clearly shows that 
it also applies to armed groups. In some states like Switzerland and Canada, the exclusion clause only excludes from the terrorist offenses lawful acts under IHL, while in some states such as Belgium and the United States, it excludes any act, lawful or not, regulated by IHL. The case law of these countries clearly shows their reluctance to apply that exclusion clause for practical, symbolic and political reasons. Most notably, it is easier for judges to prosecute terrorist offence than war crime. In any case, that exclusion clause does not prevent states from prosecuting acts committed by terrorist groups as ordinary offences. For instance, murder, rebellion, and so on.